Welcome to the Independent Advisors Podcast, where we dive into the world of stocks, tradable markets, and financial planning with Jessup Wealth Management's Chief Investment Officer, Mark McEvely, and CEO, Matt Jessup. You'll hear tips, tricks, and strategies to address your financial well-being, and most importantly, conveyed in a way that everyone can understand. Here are your hosts, Mark and Matt. Hey, everyone. Welcome to episode 218 of the Independent Advisors Podcast, where Matt Jessup and I, Mark McEvely, bring you everything you need to know from the past week in the world of financial markets and financial planning. So good morning, Matt. Morning, Mark. How are you doing today? Doing well. Uh, learning to operate on less sleep than normal with, uh, with the newborn. She'll be uh, three weeks at 5.03 p.m. tonight. Uh, all things considered, everything's going well, but it's uh, it's challenging, man. It's uh, it's not easy. It's not easy. You're in you're in triage mode, baby. You're focusing on the important things only right now. Yeah, you and you know I was joking around with uh, Sarah, Megan, and Jenna last week when I came to the office uh, to to bring Mia up. That I'm such like a schedule, and you know this too. I'm such a scheduled person, and I like to have everything that I want to do for the day like planned out. And with a baby, that just gets blown up because, you know, obviously baby comes first. So definitely an adjustment of expectations for myself and for, for the baby. So, um, but it's, it's for the better. Yep. You'll get in the groove. As always, we will review the month to date and year to date performance of the major market indices that we track. This data is from Y charts and as of September 13th. S&P 500 index is down 0.9% for the month and up 16.4% for the year. Dow Jones Industrial Average down 0.4% for the month and up 4.3% for the year. The NASDAQ Composite Index down 1.6% for the month, but still up 32% for the year. The iShares Russell 2000 uh, ETF that tracks the Russell 2000 small cap index down 3% for the month and up 4.9% for the year. And the Vanguard All World X United States ETF down 0.8% for the month and up 6.8% for the year. So it's really kind of all over the board, Matt. I mean, there hasn't been um, consistency among amongst most of the major indexes that investors track. No, then there hasn't been. And obviously, you know, the Dow's only up 4.3%. It was the, the golden child of the equity indices last year in the challenging year of 2022. Um, the other thing that's uh, that's kind of interesting, and we've been talking about this on the Independent Advisors podcast uh, pretty recently, guess what topped $90 a barrel today? Oil. Oil. Gee, I wonder if people were listening to the podcast a couple weeks ago about that. I know. I know, yeah, that uh, that was talked about. I can yes. confirm that. Yes. Um, moving on to fixed income, Matt, the three-month treasury rate at 5.55%, the two-year treasury rate at 4.96%, and the 10-year treasury rate sitting at 4.25%. Uh, moving on to big headlines, uh, I had one, Matt, that I thought was pretty interesting, so I wanted to spend some time on it. Um, yes. This is a blog post from Peter Lazaroff from PlanCorp. He's the CIO. He's been on the podcast before. And he is talking about uh, the Federal Reserve uh, launching their FedNow payment system. So uh, there was a lot of, in my opinion, misinformation that was out there being talked about in our industry. So I just wanted to uh, read a little bit of what Peter had to say on the topic. Um, because I think he did a really good job summarizing what this FedNow payment system is and what it isn't. I'm, I think our listeners and viewers are going to love this. Take it yeah. away. So, and and because this could get political too. People, you know, are pro-Fed or anti-Fed and think the Fed's in bed with the current president or the current Congress and and all that. So I think that uh, Peter does a really good job here. So. Uh, He starts off by saying, on July 20th, the Federal Reserve launched a new centralized payment system called FedNow to replace the country's antiquated system that's more than 50 years old. Through financial institutions participating in the FedNow service, businesses and individuals can send and receive instant payments in real time, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. Unlike the antiquated system it replaces, Places you will no longer have to wait 
a few days for transactions to settle. Recipients will have full access to funds immediately, which allows for greater, greater financial flexibility when making time-sensitive payments. FedNow does not replace physical dollars. Instead, it provides the backbone for instant payment services that look very similar to popular services such as Venmo or the Cash App. Cash payments have been declining for years and currently represent about 20% of payments made in the U.S. The concern amongst some people is that FedNow is the government's attempt to completely wipe out paper currency entirely. He realizes that there are people who keep significant amounts of cash and money and off the grid, quote unquote. Uh, in my opinion, there will, there will always be physical currency so long as there's actual demand for it. But the important thing is for this conversation is that FedNow is simply a more efficient payment system that is more in line with the rest of the world uh, has in place and does not represent any attempt to kill off physical currency. Due to cryptocurrency's popularity as a form of instant digital payment, some people are incorrectly assuming that FedNow is on a blockchain or somehow related to crypto. Given the fraud and high-profile issues within the crypto space, it's no surprise that the idea of the U.S. dollar becoming a digital currency would cause some anxiety. But that's not what's happening. As he said before, FedNow is a payment system and not a currency. The system isn't even on a blockchain. In fact, FedNow uses what's referred to as a conventional payment rail technology, similar to systems like ACH and wire transfers work. The only difference is their ability to happen outside of traditional business hours and settle instantly rather than over the course of multiple days. The failure of Silicon Valley Bank and First Republic Bank earlier this year has generated persistent concern among businesses and consumers about the safety of their deposits. And because both of those banks were in the 2021 FedNow pilot program, some people have incorrectly linked those two things as being correlated. As a side note, there was 110 banks in the pilot program and none of the others failed. So that was 108 out of 110 did not fail. The bank failures had nothing to do with the electronic payment processing system. Moody's also issued a warning that FedNow makes a bank run easier since depositors could pull out their cash instantly. But what this warning misses is that institutions using FedNow can still limit transactions in a manner that aligns with their risk appetite. Ooh. Not all major banks have signed up to use FedNow, but J.P. Morgan Chase and Wells Fargo are on the platform. But other giants like Bank of America, Citigroup, and Goldman Sachs are still on the sidelines. The banks sitting out are more concerned about losing profits they earn from parking cash and interest-bearing securities, while older systems take a few days to settle transactions. A few of these banks also make money from their own payment systems, so those things will slow down their adoption. There are 56 other countries with similar payment systems in place. This is the United States catching up with the rest of the world. These are developing economies that are light years ahead of us in payment systems. It's sort of like having the nicest house in town, but all your electronics and appliances are from 1970. Hmm. Some people are saying that the new payment system would allow the Fed to create more money out of thin air. First, the Fed does not create money. It's the Treasury that creates money. That's a very common misconception that gets amplified by the fact that most people in the media don't have a fundamental understanding of how our country's monetary system works. Second, people think the Fed goes completely unchecked and is never audited. But that couldn't be further from the truth. The Fed's Board of Governors, the 12 Federal Reserve Banks, and the Federal Reserve System as a whole are subject to several levels of audits and reviews. Um, so I know that was kind of a long-winded explanation of the FedNow payment system map, but I hope that kind of calms fears or anxiety for people that thought uh, that this was some sort of cryptocurrency or some sort of way to digitize the U.S. dollar. Um, you know, while that may come sometime in the future, that's not what is happening now. It's just, I think, the Fed realizing, hey, you know, the system needs to be able to compete like uh, Venmo or the Cash App, like we just talked about. Um, and in today's day and age, I think they were like, you know, why don't we have transactions that settle, you know, every single day, just like other apps do? Why can't we do the same thing? Yeah, no, I think it was a great summary.
So moving on to tweets, articles, and research from this week, Matt, the first thing I had was a blog post from J.C. Peretz on August 25th titled, Stocks Are Stuck, Deal With It. He starts off by saying the most important groups of stocks are stuck below overhead supply. That's not usually a characteristic of strong uptrends where investors are consistently rewarded for owning stocks. That was the first half of this year. Today, it's almost the exact opposite. He says, here are four of the most important groups of stocks all stuck below their prior cycle's peaks. And Jenna will throw this graphic up on the YouTube page and in our show notes, Uh, but it shows four charts. It shows uh, the technology sector chart, uh, industrial sector chart, uh, chart of semiconductors, uh, the popular ETF SMH, and then a ETF that is comprised of home builders. And these were all Uh, really strong areas of the market so far year to date. And as you can see, Matt, in this graph, uh, these charts are bumping up against their highs that were set in 2021 and having a little bit of uh, trouble, one would say, clearing those highs from 2021. So uh, this still tells me that there are still sellers at these levels uh, from the 2021 highs. And until we get a confirmed breakthrough above those highs, Uh, I think that's when you're going to see this next leg higher in the market. And I think it's as close as in Q4, because we have to remember, seasonally, September tends to be pretty weak. And mostly it's the second half of September, which starts tomorrow. Um, Mm -hmm. We're already in the second half of September if you're just counting trading days. So um, I would expect weakness over the next uh, two weeks, but uh, it's Industrials, technology, home builders, and semiconductors can clear their 2021 highs sometime in October. I think that sets up for a pretty good rally into year end. And what's the big catalyst that's going to happen in October? Earning season. Yep, earning season again. Even though we just it felt like we just cleared earning season, uh, but yeah, we're going to have earnings to kick things into gear, hopefully, and have a, a nice little Santa Claus rally into the end of the year. Sounds perfect to me. The second thing I had was a tweet from Jason Gottfurt on August 21st of this year. And Jenna will throw this up on the YouTube video and in the show notes. He says, I don't know, a 10-year breakout in the 10-year yield doesn't seem like the most bearish thing. The S&P 500 was higher six months later every time. Didn't work so well from 1870 to 1920. But then again, most of the country was still pooping in the woods at the time. So there you go. So what this shows, Matt, is uh, a breakout in the 10-year Treasury uh, yield to new highs, and then it shows the performance of the S&P 500 over different time frames. Okay, so one month after a fresh 10-year breakout in the 10-year yield to the upside, uh, S&P on average was up 3.1% and positive 71% of the time. Two months later, up 5.7% on average, or the median performance, 5.7%, up positive 86% of the time. Six months later, uh, positive by 4.3%, 100% of the time. And 12 months later, uh, the median performance was 11.3% to the upside and positive 71% of the time. So this goes back to the narrative that we were discussing that A lot of people think that if interest rates are rising or interest rates are higher than they have been um, in the near past, that the stock market can't do well. And I think this chart is a clear uh, contradiction of that narrative um, and still think that stocks can do well, even though the 10-year Treasury yield is breaking out to levels that we haven't seen in more than a decade. All right, great thing to bring up. And what it makes me think of is that NYU chart that uh, we talked about in the podcast maybe about four or five months ago that talked about how stocks have performed historically in a um, rising interest rate environment, lowering interest rate environment, rising inflationary environment, lowering inflationary environment. And stocks tend to do kind of normal or average in three out of those four. And the one where it tends to do bad is in a rising inflationary environment, which is why, you know, uh, on the Independent Advisors podcast, we pay a lot of attention to inflation and what the Fed's doing. So I think when it kind of comes to the 10 year, the market kind of goes to these periods where it's ultra focused on what it's doing with the 10 year. But like you're pointing out here, 
that 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 perception that it affects future stock prices is is not accurate. No, no, I agree. And we're you know I just pulled up a chart, uh, Matt, of the ten year yield, and uh, we're pretty close to to breaking out to the upside uh, this year base that the ten year yield has been, and so it set a new high in October of 2022. Uh, and it has yet to eclipse that level. And um, who knows, we, we might see a breakout to the upside or we might see uh, yield collapse here and start to move lower. So um, only time will tell, uh, but we will be anxiously awaiting that decision from the 10 year yield because uh, that just gives us clues as to where to put risk on, take risk off in certain areas of the market. So uh, that is something that we track very closely. Well, see, this is perfect because now I have a great transition into my piece because my first thing has to do with U.S. rents. And if you look at the government's basket of inflation, their index, the consumer price index, roughly 23 and a half percent or so is shelter. And so this is important for you know investors to be looking at to determine, you know, has the Fed properly brought in inflation so they can stop raising rates, right? So the first piece I have is going to be from Charlie Bellello, and this is um, just recent. This is over the past uh, couple of days um, and his blog. And what he showed is U.S. rents are 1.2% lower than a year ago. Yes, you heard that correct. Disinflation. This is the biggest year-over-year -year decline since December of 2020. Jenna will put up this chart for our YouTube viewers, Mark. It'll be in our show notes for our traditional listeners on all of the various social media platforms where we have um, access to LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, et cetera. What this chart is, it's going to go back to uh, January of 2018. Shows the U.S. monthly rent nationally average, year-over-year -year change, and the data that, that uh, Charlie is citing is through apartment list uh, through August 2023. So, this is important because as this data catches up to the way the government is calculating CPI, that should help provide a, a downward tailwind, let's call it, on the inflation that is X food and energy. The next chart I think Jenna should share on YouTube here is the number of the nation's 100 largest cities mark with negative year over year rent growth. And when that data came out for August, 72 of the 100 largest cities in the United States saw negative rent growth year over year. That's what you want to see if you're trying to bring in inflation. The next chart has to do with apartment list vacancies. So when um, you know things were in high demand, um, the uh, the peak in that rate was uh, 2021, October 2021. You saw the vacancy rate drop to 3.9 percent. Fast forward to August 2023, you now are at 6.4 percent. So more vacancies, that's affecting prices. Old school supply and demand metrics at work. So last chart is going to be U.S. rents versus U.S. shelter consumer price index. Now, we've talked about this a lot on the podcast the last couple of years. we got to remember, the CPI is not taking real-time data, Mark. It's surveys. It's old school. And when you look at this last chart from Charlie, it shows that the government is calculating year-over-year -year inflation on the shelter side at a positive 7.7%. But wait a minute. The real-time data from sources like Apartment List are showing negative year-over-year -year growth of 1.2%. The fact that that's the case will help the inflation numbers over the coming months as the government data catches up. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. And while you were just talking, I pulled up uh, our little Fed watch tool here. And right now there's a 39% chance that the Fed will hike again in November. So yeah. um, again, it's going to be Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see if, if they do do anything, um, you know, I, I couldn't tell you, but uh, I know that the Fed views inflation uh, very differently than most average Americans, I would say. So, um, yeah, we're just going to have to to wait and see here. But um, like always, you know, we don't want to see the Fed do too much and, and swing that pendulum to, to too far of one end of the spectrum just to have to swing it all the way back. Um, if that does eventually drive the economy into a recession, but 
um, things are still headed in the right direction uh, with inflation. And obviously, uh, energy and shelter, huge, huge parts and components of that. Yeah, I think of a whole kind of in, in inflation kind of setup. The one I'm concerned about the most continues to be energy. I think there could be some upside pressure on energy. And we've talked about it a lot in the podcast the last couple of weeks. Outside of that, I think that the data is encouraging, I guess is a good way to say it, right? So my next piece has to do with market sentiment. I always enjoy looking at market sentiment surveys. Um, this piece in the source is Bespoke Investment Group. Um, we've had um, members of Bespoke on the podcast before in the past. They do great raw research. Data mark is from September 8th, sir. I'm going to start by reading word for word. As we discussed in this post on Thursday, the latest weekly sentiment indicators like the AAII survey have indicated rebounds in bullish sentiment following sharp declines in the wake of weak equity performance in August. In addition to weekly indicators, earlier this week, TD Ameritrade published their August update of their investment movement index. Unlike other sentiment indicators, which surveys respondents on their perceptions of the market's future direction, i.e. the AAII or the Investors Intelligence Surveys. The IMX, which is again the TD Ameritrade Movement Index, helps to showcase what retail investors are actually doing with their accounts, Mark. Converse to the more bearishly inclined moving, moves I'm sorry, of those other indicators, the TD Ameritrade Index continued to press higher, reaching the most bullish reading since May of 2022. Jen is going to put up this chart, and it's going to show uh, four different, say, sentiment indicator indices and their levels. <clears throat> My point, though sentiment surveys have come down since the recent market correction that started at the beginning of August, the TD Ameritrade positioning survey suggests that individuals are, quote, buying the dip and the question is mark will those investors be rewarded is yet to be seen but i find this data interesting you know you got to follow the money and this is a good index to actually see what people are doing your thoughts yeah well, i was scrolling on twitter last night and i saw that um someone had posted and i agree with this individual i don't remember who it was but said something along the lines of everyone is talking about, you know, an imminent crash or a correction right now because we're getting closer and closer to all time highs in some of uh, the major indices. Um, but no one's really talking about, well, what if it just breaks up to the upside? Um, so, you know, I think there for a little bit, obviously this year has been pretty good for the S&P 500. So people you know, got really bullish after most of that money was already made. And that was a contributing factor to the summer lull that we had in addition to several other things. But um, interesting uh, data for sure. I've never heard of this before. This is the first time I've ever laid eyes on this TD Ameritrade Investor Movement Index. But it looks like uh, so far, you know, throughout the whole year, they have been adding to their, their stock exposure. Pretty interesting, huh? You know, when I kind of think about, you know, you know, stocks and this recent kind of lull, you know, keep an eye on forward looking S&P 500 earnings estimates. And Ryan Dietrich had a piece on that a couple of weeks ago that I talked about in the podcast. You're still seeing upward revisions to the expectation of earnings over the next 12 months. And uh, I know I'll get a, ch a chuckle out of Jenna on this. That's not bearish. OK, no. So, um you know, that's something that I think investors need to keep an eye on. And guess what's right around the corner a month from now? Earning season. So it's going to bring that focus back to the fundamentals. And I don't think they're that bad in general. My last piece, cautionary tale of blindly following the talking heads advice. So this is a piece also from Charlie Bellello on September 6th. I loved it. I want to share it with our viewers and listeners. Uh, Jenna will put up this chart for our YouTube viewers. It is a, uh, a stat of various quotes uh, from uh, Michael Burry, and he is the very well-known call of the big short, uh, who was shorting subprime mortgages in the 2000s that continues to uh, get headlines with very bold calls. And what this chart shows is, what is the six-month annualized S&P rise after Michael Burry's warnings. 
You know, first one was, quote, bubble in passive investing. That was August 28th of 2019. Uh, six months later, annualized. Looks like it's positive by about 5%. Next was March 13th, 2020, quote, significant bearish market bet. The market uh, annualized return six months later, 96.05%. Then we had on June 16th, 2021, greatest speculative bubble. Six months later, annualized return of S&P over 20%. Next, we had September 29th, 2022. We had could be worse than 2008. That's a pretty concerning headline. And the market was almost up again, another 20% annualized over six months. And the last uh, data set mark, January 31st of this year, 2023, sell. In all caps, market was up about 25% annualized over six months. Why am I bringing this up? Investors, clients, you got to follow your plan. Just because you have somebody who nailed a call literally over 15 years ago and hasn't got anything right since, doesn't mean you blindly follow that advice and apply it to your situation. Those are my words of wisdom today. Yeah, no, I love this. It's like, you know, kind of uh, um, how we could put this for, you know, athletes, for example. If someone gets a hole in one, that doesn't mean that they're a good golfer, right? I've, I've played with people. I actually played with someone who it was one of his first time playing golf. He was horrible, absolutely horrible. But he got lucky and he sculled uh, uh, an iron shot on a par three and he got a hole in one. But just because someone gets a hole in one doesn't necessarily mean they're a good golfer. And it's the same thing here. Just because someone gets something right once in their career or twice in their career doesn't mean that they're going to continue to be right. And this is, you know, something that I think is a bigger detriment to people than, uh, than a benefit. And, you know, I was going to save this, Matt, for next week. But just because you brought this up, I feel like I need to share it since we're on a roll here. Um, it was a tweet from Bar Chart, and I'll uh, give this information to Jenna to throw up on the YouTube video. A tweet from Bar Chart uh, yesterday that said the S&P 500 could plunge 25% if something shocks the system, warns Morgan Stanley's CIO, Mike Wilson. So that could headline, happen at any time. That could happen at any time. That's what I said, too. So let's just like look at this. The S&P 500 looks risky and expensive and could plunge 25% if something shocks the system. What? I've been, like, hearing, where, I've been, hearing, the, I've been hearing the market is expensive for the last 15 years since the GFC, great financial crisis, and it's up like what, 600%? But it's just like, and then it says the S&P 500 is priced for perfection and could plunge 25% if problems crop up. If problems crop up, what type of problems? It's just whatever problem it is, it's going to it's going to drop by at least 25 percent. Well, they're also I mean, making they're, like, they're also making the assumption is... that everything's perfect right now. Are you kidding me? There are a lot of it's... naysayers. This market's climbing a wall of worry. We're still in the disbelief phase. Everyone's calling for the next crash constantly. It's just shocking to me that, you know, people continue to get away with this stuff and there's no repercussions for if they're wrong. It's just like these these uh clickbaity headlines that that's right if you're going to go on all the financial networks there should be the last times you were on the network your call performance since yeah exactly i mean it's just yeah could plunge 25 percent if something shocks the system it's no like, kidding it's like come on man it's like <laughs> i mean you're... you've always said it too what causes bigger market corrections tends to be what not everybody's focused on. If everyone's focused on it and talking about it, it tends to be the thing that doesn't break the market. Yeah. You've, you've said yeah. that a lot on the podcast. Yeah, absolutely. Cause it's, it's true. So I just, I, it, it bothers me to see headlines like that because people will make investment decisions based off reading that. I mean, exactly. And that's yeah, why I brought it up, Mark. It's why I brought it up. Cause I know the, that's, the I, I, fortunately I know family. it's the case. Yeah. I know it's the case. So. Uh, Back over anyway, to you for the financial planning topic of the week. Yeah, so moving on to that, we have an article from Paula Spann in the New York Times titled, Why Financially Successful Retirees 
have a harder time getting a mortgage. And I got this from uh, a summary of this article provided by kitthis.com. So they start off by saying, despite older Americans having often built some significant retirement wealth and having higher credit scores on average, researchers have found that they are more likely to be rejected for most kinds of mortgages. A study from the Federal Reserve Bank of Philadelphia found that applicants for refinance mortgages experienced a rejection rate at 17.5%. Those in their 60s saw their applications rejected at 19%, and those older than 70 were rejected 20% of the time. A separate study from the Urban Institute of Applicants for All Types of Mortgages found a rejection rate at 18.7% for those aged 75 or older in 2020, compared to 15.4% for those between 65 and 74, and 12.1% for those younger than 65. Despite the fact that, again, retirees typically have greater wealth and the best credit scores to indicate that they'll likely repay the mortgage. These data points raise the question of why older mortgage applicants are rejected at a higher rate than their younger counterparts. To start, the Fed study found that more than half of the rejections of older applicants were due to, quote, insufficient collateral, end quote, perhaps because lenders appraise the homes for less than the applicants had thought. Lenders might also be concerned about mortality risk as the death of the borrower could lead to the loan being paid off uh, a form of reinvestment risk for the lender, as in the case of the borrower's death, the lender might not be able to relend the proceeds at a similar or higher rate, or the property could end up in foreclosure, which could cost the bank legal fees in order to recover the amount left on the mortgage. In addition, a retiree might find that the lack of regular income from employment could reduce the chances of being approved for a loan as lenders prefer to see regular income from a job, even if the borrower has a wealth and has wealth in retirement uh, accounts that could also be used to repay the loan. So I thought this was interesting, Matt. Um, but after kind of reading through the article, it, it kind of does uh, make sense to me. But I could see how this could be frustrating for people that money is not really a problem, but they're getting rejected for a refi or getting rejected for uh, a new mortgage on a new house that they bought or a new condo. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, you have these conversations uh, with our client base and, you know, usually the kind of the question comes up, hey, Matt, my mortgage is X and I'm just going to throw out uh, this example. Let's say it's sub three and a half percent, you know, and, hey, should I just take a withdrawal from my investment portfolio and just pay this off? And then we start, you know, applying that question to their personal situation. But then, you know, I think you're going to see this just pushes more and more cash transactions. It's going to. Yeah. So I guess piece of advice for, for people that are around these ages is, you know, if you're a planner like myself, as I mentioned uh, earlier in the podcast, and uh, you have an idea of where you want to be for the rest of your life, uh, might make sense to to jump on that uh, while you're younger uh, to increase the chance or the odds of you uh, being able to get that property, especially if you uh, you need a loan for it. Yeah, I guess my other comment in regards to real estate, this is a personal observation. I'm not backing this up by a specific data set. I'm um, still seeing, you know, real estate for the most part is hot. I know we have limited supply and our rates are high, but, you know, from my vantage point, again, personal observation, I'm still seeing, you know, real estate go for some crazy prices in a very quick time period when it goes in the market. How about you? Yeah, for sure. I mean, there's, I mean, I think I sent you a house earlier this week uh, on Zillow in our neighborhood, Matt, that yep. uh, is going for a number that I think me and you thought was a little more than it should be worth, but um, a little more. Just, yeah, <laughs> or a lot more. Yeah, <laughs> I won't be blunt. Uh, but it's just, um, it, it's really interesting. And I'm trying to, while we're talking about it, pull up. I mean, I guess uh, if there's, if there's this much of a lack of rate. supply in general, you can ask what you want. Doesn't mean you're going to get it. Um, yeah. No, I, I guess a data point I'd love to see is as as new as we can get the data, what the stuff, what this real estate started to be listed for and what it actually sold for. And I, I don't, I don't have that data and I'd love to get my hands on it, 
Um, I know some um, some realtors in town, and so I'm going to reach out to them, Mark, this week and see if I can get that data point, at least for the Dayton, uh, uh, you know, in surrounding areas. I think that'd be interesting to look at. Yeah. Can you, I'll give you a guess, Matt. What do you think the current um, 30 year mortgage rates are at right now on average? I would say 6.85%. 7.12%. Oh, uh, we which is seven again. Uh, we were we dipped yeah. under it. I know, um, but we yeah we dipped under it for a, a little bit. But um, the average over the past ten years is four point one four percent. So uh, man, I remember yeah, when about I, three points over the average. Remember when I started in the industry in ninety nine? There was a guy in the office who uh, secured a VA loan for seven and he was like high five and people as he was like it once he got the call that he had locked it in at seven <laughs> percent crazy it's 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 nuts and now people are pissed off with seven percent right yeah um, yeah it just goes so, to show you just because inherently we're in a higher interest rate environment doesn't necessarily mean it's going to destroy real estate that's not necessarily the case you got other factors no, at play all. and it's specifically supply and demand right now and this is, and and to add to that, I think this is why it 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 doesn't have to destroy real estate. Is the home ownership rate in the U.S. Matt is sixty six percent. So sixty six percent of eligible pe eligible people own a home in the U.S. And I would make the argument again. I'm not going off the of data, but most of those people have locked in low interest rates. So in my opinion, there's not going to be another housing crisis like there was in 2007, 2008. Do I think prices are going to come in eventually? Yeah, I think they will. Um, but you have a lot of people that are locked in at low rates and they're not going to move until rates start to come down. Because again, why, why would you go out and get something for 7.12% over 30 years while you're paying three, for example? Yeah. And you're missing the other big the big point, too, which is underwriting is still extremely strict. You might as well do a cavity search and give them a blood sample while you're filling out the application. I mean, right. they're not willy-nilly just saying, oh, what's your income, Mark? And you throw a number out there, and they're like, that's all I need. Right. You know, th those days are still way gone. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, anything else, Matt, before we wrap up for the week? I just want to reiterate something you talked about in the podcast uh, roughly about a month ago. We're looking at seasonality, August and September, we tend to have the weakest part of that seasonality is the second half of September. So if you see some sluggishness in the market the next couple of weeks, that's the way seasonality works. Uh, I'm still in this camp that I, I'm 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 expecting personal opinion, expecting more strength uh, in, in Q4. Uh, we'll see if that actually happens or not. Um, but uh, earnings season kicks off in a month. The banks will kick off in the middle of October, but uh, might expect some sluggishness. We'll see if it continues next couple of weeks. Yeah, we'll see. And again, I think people should um, be expecting some volatility. So I don't want people to, uh, you know, go into freak out mode if the market is really, really weak over over these next two weeks because uh, this tends to be the weakest part of the year. Um, but the optimistic thing. Uh, behind that is the strongest part of the year uh, tends to be Q4. So uh, just following the weakest part of the year. So um, we're going to expect some volatility. We've got to hang in there, encourage people to do the same. Uh, and we think that uh, Q4 is going to be a good quarter. Yes, sir. All right. Well, thank you for tuning in to episode 218 of the Independent Advisors podcast. We hope you all have a wonderful weekend and we'll be back with you next week. Take care, everyone. Thank you for listening to the Independent Advisors podcast. If you're interested in hearing more, hit the subscribe button so you can be notified every time a new episode gets released. Feel free to share with friends, family, and follow us on Twitter at Jessup Wealth, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Mark and Matt will continue to share beneficial information on these social media sites. Also, check out the podcast tab on their website. That's www.jessupwealthmanagement.com. There you'll find links to every episode of the Independent Advisors. Have 
have questions or topics you want to discuss on the show, message us on Twitter, LinkedIn, or send an email with the words questions and topics in the subject line to inquiries at jessupwealthmanagement.com. We'll talk about it right here on the podcast. Certain sections of this commentary may contain forward-looking statements based on reasonable expectations, estimates, projections, and assumptions. Forward-looking statements are not guarantees of future performance and involve certain risks and uncertainties, which are difficult to predict. All indices are unmanaged and are not available for direct investment by the public. Past performance is not indicative of future results. This podcast is provided for general informational purposes only and does not constitute either tax, legal, or financial advice. Although we do go to great lengths to make sure our information is accurate and useful, we recommend you consult a tax preparer, professional tax advisor, financial advisor, or lawyer regarding your specific circumstances. Investing involves risk, including the loss of principal. No strategy can guarantee any objective or goal will be achieved.